from garden shed came in the house and I've got a space about 25 feet long which is luxury for most railway modelers and uh, I didn't have that much depth uh, I knew I was going to be restricted a lot of the time to something like 2 feet 18 feet depth and I wanted to model rural Wales I'm not going to get rural Wales into 2 feet 8 inches, that's not going to work, especially in 7 millimetre scale. So I thought, how can I use a back scene, blend that into the uh, 3D model parts of the layout um, effectively? And I've read loads and loads of railway magazines, like model railway magazines, like we all have. and seen photographs and I've seen beautiful models by people like Martin Welsh um, photographed against photographic back scenes and I thought that looks great in the magazine but if you were actually looking at it would it look a bit flat? And that's what I was trying to get away from the idea that the back scene is a flat picture plane and the model is 3D and the two don't really connect with each other. Now, if you can indulge me for a minute or two, I'm just going to quickly talk through my layout and then I'll get on to the specifics of how I did the uh, perspective modelling part of it. It's, my layout is based in Mid Wales. If you know Mid Wales, uh, here's the Dovey Estuary and the border and um, the Corris Railway is more or less at the top of the Corris Railway is just below that red block. Um, the Corris Railway came under the eyes of the Great Western and the uh, Cambrian Railways in the 1860s. They were both thinking of buying it and converting it to standard gauge and extending it through to the Great Western Line from uh, Rubabon to um, uh, Barmer. And in my world, uh, the Cambrian bought it and uh, built a standard gauge line right through from McCunslith. And uh, Clan Idris, as a village, grew as a result because there was access to it. Uh, the year is now 1946, just after the war and the railway has suffered badly with flooding so the top the north section of the railway is cut off and uh, the my station is now the northern tip of what's left of it so that's where it is on the map now above the um, bridge at the north end of the station there's just flood water and you can see it leak through onto the track here. There's uh, a couple of narrow gauge lines in the area still. This one passes behind the station. There's the narrow gauge engine shed. And this engine shed is loosely modelled on the engine shed at Myers Poet on the Corris Railway. That's the station itself, which was based on Clambrian Mire on the Cambrian main line. What I've done is to make a mirror image of Clambrian Mire and shorten it a bit so it didn't look too overwhelming for the space I've got. Now, in that scene, we're standing back a bit and we're looking into the corner of my railway room the corner is about here. So the back scene goes round a corner with a radius of, I think it's about 18 inches, something like that. Um, and I've painted the back scene so that it will make sense wherever you're standing in the room or as, as far as possible. Uh, so the shapes of the mountains aren't that critical. In other words, you can move around and it still looks like a mountain 
wherever you're standing. It might be slightly different shape, but it still looks believable. There's a dry stone wall here, going up the side of the hill. And once again, that still looks believable. If you move around a bit, the angle will change a bit, but then you, you, your eyes can accept that. If I painted that dry stone wall straight up the back seam, as it might look if you're facing straight onto it, it would look wrong straight away if we moved to one side or the other. It would look like this pole coming out of the ground. I'll go into that a little bit more later. Oops. Right, that's the southern end of the layout. The tunnel mouth there goes through into the fiddle yard, which is hidden under the hills here. And the fiddle yard is actually a big train turntable, so it can spin the trains right around 180 degrees. The buildings here start in full fat 3D and then get gradually squashed, and I've been told by a gentleman here that the shape I'm talking about is a rhomboid. <laughs> I think it's a rhomboid, it's sort of diamond shape. As I got nearer and nearer to the back seat, yeah, I might be wrong, but <laughs> we'll go for rhomboid for now. And then by the time they get back to here, they are completely flat against the back seat, although some of them have got a little bit of surface detail in them. For example, strips of card to represent the roof slates, uh, so that there isn't a sudden jump from things that are modelled to things that are just painted completely flat on the picture plane. Um, another thing that may be obvious or may not be obvious is what I've done in the back scene here. The colours fade out as they go further back. And if you've ever done any landscape painting, you might have come across the term aerial perspective. Aerial perspective is not about vanishing points and things like that. It means to do with changing colours and tones as they recede from you so that things look more distant. And as a kind of rule of thumb way of achieving that effect, whatever you're using in the sky colour, you mix that into the colour that you're painting on the landscape. So my sky is sort of greys and blues, so this mountain side there has got more greys and blues in it than greens. So the local colour of the hillside may be green, it might be covered in grass, but whatever colour it actually is when you're close up to it, it's going to look different when you're further away. And as I say, rule of thumb, put some sky colour in it. Again, I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, here's my train turntable when it was under construction. Here's the tunnel mouth before it got built. This is looking under one of the baseboards to show why it's not here today, because it weighs a ton. Uh, there's some lumps of chipboard integrated with plywood, and it's very, very heavy. Oops. Right. Now, I'm showing the baseboards there because the height is fairly critical. Uh, if the perspective is going to work, then the model has got to be reasonably high. I mean, if we had a model on one of these tables here, none of this perspective modelling would work at all because you've got to control what people are actually seeing. You have to be at a uh, sort of eye level with your models if, if you're going to have any effective perspe uh, perspective in the um, transition from the models into the back scene. The 
the track work, if you're interested, is uh, C and L, and the points are all made using template. I haven't built any locomotives myself, they're all ready to run. That's a tower brass uh, 4575. I painted myself, painted it with that paintbrush rather than spray. Now, I did masses of sketching before I started the layout. Um, I, I was waiting for a house move, and so, which is a good thing because it forced me to do a lot of planning. So I, I made a lot of sketches, not thinking, oh, I could put this uh, bit of the layout there and I could have an engine shed here or whatever. I wasn't thinking of those terms. I was thinking of just any scenes I could imagine that I would like to see. So I've got sketchbooks crammed full of little doodles and ideas uh, without worrying about how I was going to use them. And then I, I spent quite a bit of time thinking through some of the technical problems as well. Like, um, my, my previous efforts at railway modelling had been in double O or EM gauge, and they'd all had reliability problems, you know, baseboard joints that weren't perfect and that sort of thing. And I, I thought, I don't want to have any kind of reliability issues at all. So I, I put quite a lot of time into thinking how to get the reliability as close as possible to 100%. And that all paid off well because it, it, one thing about the layout is that it does work very reliably. Um, I did a bit of doodling around with Photoshop. As I, as I was taking photographs while I was constructing it, I, I sat with a graphics tablet just sketching on where I thought the bits of scenery would go to see if it was matching up to my um, what I was hoping for. So I've got a photograph of baseboard under construction just quickly scribbled on the, the scene as I thought it might be when I'd gone a bit further. That was quite helpful. Uh, some of the inspiration I've had has come from you know people in the absolute top echelons to me like people like Martin Welsh and, and obviously places like Penden Museum but also I've been inspired sometimes by quite sort of humble layouts, um, like there was this model I saw in Railway Modern in the 1980s which was, I think it was called Breeden by a gentleman called uh, AC Woods and it was just a little oval, like a kid's layout but it had got a real atmosphere to, to it and there was another layout that inspired me which um, was a Welsh diorama uh, it popped up in the 80s in the railway model uh, called Nabo Minak. And, you know, simple, ready-to-run models, but it's full of atmosphere. While I was building the layout, I made a lot of trying out trail models. You know, just trying, knocking things together quickly to just see if they looked any good in particular positions. So those are all just quick try-out models made in bits of cardboard boxes. So um, a bit of inspiration here. This is Copper Hill Street Bridge in Aberduffy. Um, this is my kind of recreation of it on my layout, uh, mixed with a bit of chorus. I'm looking steeply up the street here and uh, trying to get that feel of being able to look up and see the trains from a very low angle. Same bridge again. Just in a bit. Right, this is a house in Corris. I used, I got this image off um, Google Street View, which is an incredibly useful resource. Uh, then that's my recreation of it, which features on the layout. That's Flanbrin Meyer Station on the Cambrian main line. Um, now it's a house. 
this is my version of it, uh, mirror image. That's just a, a kind of area that you so this bit here is my layout. This is to show the area that it's in. I, I mean, I'm going to skip through these fairly quickly. Th these were, this image was done for BRM magazine. That's the layout itself. And the layout. Google Street View, full of ideas for landscapes. You, know, you can roam around Wales without leaving your living room. And um, uh, very useful if you're trying to paint a landscape or something, you just got some inspiration. This is looking up the main street of Palladis with a fully 3D model here, a slightly flatter model, then a very flat model, and then back scene. I've already mentioned uh, the idea that perspective changes when you move around. This is a comfortable landscape. If you walked into an art gallery and you approached it from one side, you might see that. And you don't have a problem with the perspective because you know it's a picture. Your brain can interpret it the way comfortable wanted you to. You walk past it, it still looks okay. You walk to the other side, it still looks okay. But if you put a flat scene like that behind your railway, it's going to clash at a number of points with your 3D models. So that was where I started to think that some forced perspective is necessary. Um, now, here, I've just made a bit of foam board an example. Here's my flat model railway type scene with a road on it. Here's a back scene. The road is disappearing into the distance and from this one angle it looks okay. You can believe in the perspective of the road. It makes sense. But if I move to the side it looks very strange. The road has now turned into a sort of co cobra or something sticking up into the air. It just doesn't work. What's the way around that? Well, what I found worked for me was to avoid any perpendicular lines on the back scene that are joined into the flat model area in front of me. So here, the road is leaving the flat area at an angle and twisting at an angle and then the problem goes away. So if I look from the side, it doesn't look perfect, but it doesn't have that um, really clashing kind of perpendicular thing going on. Uh, and again, that's what's happening in this wall back here. It's, it's on a diagonal, so it looks plausible. Here, the, the wall is coming out of the back scene. It's, it's modelled a little bit in very low relief on the back scene with um, polyfiller or whatever it was, I can't remember now. And then gradually it emerges into a 3D wall. While I was doing that, I kept moving around to see if, it, if the perspective still looked okay. I mean, there's an awful lot of trial and error in the way I work. I don't really always know exactly what I'm doing before I start. I do a lot of trial and error. That's why the little rough attempts are a good idea, because um, you don't waste so much time. Uh, this was an that's an earlier stage before it before done buildings up here. Here's the main street going from fully 3D, a bit flatter, very flat, then painted on the back scene. Uh, 
Now, I've included this picture because this is looking through the southern tunnel now, and none of the perspective makes sense here. Right? The, all the vaccine, all the low relief buildings, they don't work. Normally, nobody crouches inside my fiddly yard looking out through the tunnel now, so I don't, I'm not worried. But um, I mean, I'm just making a point here that if your perspective is going to work, you have to control where people are going to look at your layout from. So you have to restrict the viewpoints. Uh, looking straight onto the railway, all the problem goes away. You can accept the perspective that's painted on the back scene, the low relief models, the force perspective, and the 3D models. It all makes some sort of sense. To illustrate the idea of the um, transition, this building is fully 3D. That one looked from above is a rhomboid. <laughs> Thank you. And that one there is almost flat. It's what I would think of as low relief. It's a very squished rhomboid. Now that is going to result in some very odd shapes while you're building it. And you have to just have faith that it's going to work. Before I started that, I made a paper version, just using um, stiff paper and sellotape. And I just hacked away it until it looked okay. There wasn't much science in it. It was more guesswork and art than science. But the point of doing it quickly with sellotape and you know, just a bit of card or paper is that if it goes wrong, you don't feel as though you've just wasted hours and hours and, uh, and you, you're less worried about chucking it in the bin. If it works, then at that point, then I start taking measurements and building it a little bit more carefully. I mean, if you've seen any of my models downstairs, you'll know that they're, they're not kind of craftsman built. There's a lot of kind of bodgery going on, but then that, that's just a personal thing. I mean, you could make them very carefully if you, chose, if you choose. So you can see here, this building is almost completely flattened. That one is um, somewhere in between, and that one is more or less a normal 3D building. It does have consequences for the details. I mean, the roof slates, for example, on this building here, they are normal rectangular roof slates. On this one, they're a little bit sort of diamond shaped, or, and on this one, they're very, very squished rhomboids, or diamond shapes. Uh, again, it's trial and error. Um, I'll show you my methods for roof slates a bit later. Right, I'm going to just switch to a different folder of slides if you can bear with me for a minute. stop me at any point, please do. Uh, in this bit of the talk, I'm going to look at more than how to do it, rather than what I've done. Right at the start, 
okay? Before I started the layout, I thought, right, I've got to get the height right because I was aware that if you're not looking at something on eye level, it's not going to work. So my track level is here somewhere, which is a lot higher than a lot of layouts. And for my grandkids, I've got I'm about to build a sort of complicated set of steps so that the oldest one can stand on the bottom step and the youngest one stands on the top step. Um, there's a kind of screen here at the top which hides the lighting, a bit like a proscenium arch in a theatre. And then everything in front of the layout is sort of black so that um, there's no distraction. So you've got like a narrow strip uh, to view the layout from and it fills the whole length of my shed so you can't get round the end to see it from the end. So I'm trying to control what people will actually see. That's the baseboards and the construction so you can see that you can judge from that that it's uh, quite high. You can also see that the room is also used for all sorts of other things. It's a music practice room and heaven knows what. That's why I didn't have that much space over here. Um, well, I've got rather a lot of text there. I don't know whether you can read that. But, um, the back scene painting the back scene. I'm going to talk about this because it's part of the whole thing. I know that the talk was advertised as being about some false perspective, but this is part of the same thing to me. Uh, one or two terms, defining terms. When I talk about hue, I mean whether something is red or blue or green or yellow or whatever. When I talk about saturation, I mean how strong the colour is. So if you think about um, an old style colour TV where you turn up the colour knob, you're going from black and white, uh, turning it to very vivid colours, which I would describe as more saturated. And the value, or another word people use is tone, is how light or how dark something is. <coughs> now, if you're painting the back scene, and, and please forgive me if um, you know, I don't want to teach my grandmother to suck eggs or whatever the saying is. Some of you may be more, a lot more expert than I am at painting back scenes. But what I, in general, I would say to people, avoid using any very saturated colours. If you know that your field that you're trying to paint is, is really rich green grass and you paint it with a rich green colour of paint it will probably jump out at you too much so colours in the back scene should probably not be too saturated even on a clear day in full sunshine there will be a softening of colours as they are further away from you for all sorts of reasons like there's dust and moisture in the air it changes the colours you see. Uh, so that it was practical to paint something 24 feet long, I started off with great big brushes. I was using uh, poster colours, my kids' poster colours, and old emulsion paints. I wasn't really that fussy what I was using. Um, they're all fine. Uh, I was painting onto hardboard, so obviously if you're painting on hardboard it needs to have some priming first, otherwise the colour of the hardboard is going to show through. So just, um, I think I used um, a thin down emulsion as a primer first. Then painted on my background colours quickly for anything else. Now, a lot of people use acrylic paints for back scenes. And I, I do use acrylic paints, but to me they have some limitations. One problem with uh, acrylic paints is also one of their strengths. They dry very quickly. 
If you're trying to get something done quickly and you want it to dry quickly, that's great. If you want to blend your colours together, then not so good. You can use a retarder to slow them down, but if you're going to do that, you're making it more and more complicated, so I don't use them very much. Uh, kids post the colours a lot of the time are just fine. When I got onto the more um, finely detailed bits, I switched to using artists' oil paints um, because I like them, I like using them, and they're easy to blend together. But there are some drawbacks there as well. If you're painting a big area and you're using white spirit or something like that to thin your paints down, you've got to be a little bit careful because there's going to be heavy vapours coming off um, the paint. So you need plenty of ventilation. And if you're, if you're working in that atmosphere for a long time, you've got to be careful. You give yourself a little stick of a headache. Um, things like clouds. I did last, and the clouds on Hanigris I did with some sticky old, uh, old style oil based gloss house paint and a very bad condition old paintbrush that had got a bit stiff. Uh, so I sort of scumbled the paint on, just dipping the end of the brush in it and then spreading it out quite roughly so that the colours underneath would show through so I could get the effect of clouds covering a mountainside but not uh, completely hiding it. And a lot of rubbing in, sometimes using an old piece of rag to soften the effect out. And you have to remember, if you're painting a big scene, that people are going to be stood back from it. It's a bit like painting stage scenery. There's no point in doing it with a little tiny paintbrush, beautifully, because nobody's going to see that. I mean, anything on a stage has to be sort of exaggerated, a bit like when you, know, when you dress people up and put stage makeup on them. It has to be more than you think it should be. Uh, I've, I've said here, keep stepping back to look at the whole thing. So rather than concentrating on one little bit for the whole day, uh, move back so you can see the whole thing in one go. When it was finished, I didn't want any gloss, I didn't want any shine on it which would spoil the effect. So I used matte varnish and found it didn't really work, it wasn't really matte enough. But what I found did the trick was using lots and lots of Johnson's baby powder mixed into the varnish. It works really well as a matting agent and then uh, I could paint it on and there is now zero gloss even where I've used gloss paint. Right, now when I painted the back scene, I began with the sky, and at the top, um, I started with more saturated, darker tones. Now, the sky, obviously could be very different on a different day or in different weather conditions so what i'm saying is very much the kind of rule of thumb if you're not actually a painter you know and you don't, if you don't have very much experience of painting landscapes then this is just a kind of guideline which will generally work okay but obviously you know the sky can vary hugely the colors can change uh, all sorts of things can change. I've got satura more saturated colour at the top, less saturated, lighter tones at the bottom. And if I was trying to do that on a great big wall like that, I'd be using a great big brush, maybe like a four inch brush, putting it on quite quickly, blending the colours together as I work down. I do the sky first for the simple reason that it's going to be behind everything else and it's at the top. You can often think of a landscape in kind of layers, a bit like pantomime scenery, you know, where each layer is cut out of a piece of board and stacked in front of another one. So as a simple way of creating a landscape, 
And this is what I've done here on the Shlamin. I've broken the landscape down into layers. So my most distant layer here has got very little of it of the local colour. You know, whatever these mountains are made of, whatever rock or grass, you can barely see it. It's mostly the colour of the sky that is influencing the colour I've used there. So a lot of sky colour blended into what I think the local colour should be. And now I've added here some highlights. You need to, it's a good idea to think about where your daylight is coming from and where the sun is in the sky or something. And the highlights are adding a bit of detail that are all lighter tones than that background colour. Here I've added another of my pantomime scenery layers of hills, a step forward, a deeper tone, a little bit more saturated, a little bit more of the local colour, less of the sky colour mixed in, and straight away it starts to pull forward, so you've got a little bit of a sense of depth in the picture. I've added a bit more light tone for some detail in that layer. And then I've added a third layer of pantomime scenery, which is a much deeper tone, more saturated, and uh, more the local colour. And if you look at what I've got in my layout here, that's more or less exactly what I've just been showing you. Very light tones, not much local colour, a bit more uh, local colour, deeper tone, and so forth as it comes forward. The sky has its uh, darker tones at the top, like I just said. But as I mentioned before, I painted the clouds uh, and the mist on afterwards. Finally, some light tone detail on the foreground areas. Right, this is a little bit of um, the transition stage here between my forced perspective models and the back scene. These buildings are painted onto the back scene, but I've added on things like barge boards and guttering and roof slates to just pull it a little bit forwards so that it doesn't suddenly switch from being a model to being a painting. Now, back to rhomboids. Um, if I'm modelling a building that's near to the front of my baseboard, it's going to be a, a conventional 3D model, scale down, and if it's a rectangular building, it will be a rectangular shape like that. As it gets a bit nearer to the background, the shapes are getting compressed. Now, if you're good at maths, which I'm not, you could actually work out some system for doing that, but I found that just trial and error works for me. So by the time we get back here, the model is almost completely flat. Uh, if any of you want any of these images, they're available here. Um, how are we doing for time? Um, we've got about a quarter now. Right. Um, is there anything anybody would like to talk about for, you know, so that if there's something that you think I'm missing out on, then please say. Or if, there's, if you'd like to ask anything about anything I've shown you so far, uh, please do say. Yeah, D8, my, my, my tennis D8. I've got some of the models there. Uh, I, unfortunately, I couldn't bring the whole thing up because 
I'd need a team of removal people, but um, um, I've, brought, I've brought some of the buildings, and um, there's one example that shows normal 3D modelling, forced perspective, uh, low relief, and completely flat. Yes, so it's in going steps. D8, yes. Yes, I will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the gentleman said I've not mentioned scale. Now, obviously we're starting off with 7 millimeters to the foot. But, uh, what I've done, as my models approach the back scene, I've gone a little bit, probably a little bit under that. With these Welsh cottages, it's very difficult to talk about an exact scale because uh, a lot of the buildings, they are unique. So you can't really say that there is a correct size for a particular building. But a lot of the features, uh, make it the scale can be a little bit ambiguous. But there are some things like roof slates, for example, where you know you have an expectation of how big they should be. Uh, and uh, in the case of a, a, a roof slate, um, I, I've actually taken some care to keep the scale consistent. What I've done in, uh, at the kind of transition point from the 3D models into the back scene is to... What I've done is to begin reducing the scale and as the, if you were to take any measurements of the closest buildings painted onto the back seat, they would be fractionally below 7, milli, seven millimetres to the foot. And there is not actually an area at the south end of the layout, which I haven't photographed because it's still being built, uh, which is high up on a hill over the fiddle yard and uh, it's, it's so high that it's nearly touching the ceiling of, of my shed. Uh, and at that point, I've actually used an old four millimeter scale model uh, to, to give it some depth. And there will be probably five or six millimeter scale models in front of it, so I can distort the perspective. And it's another way of creating an illusion of depth, it's changing the scale. Um, does that sort of address the question? Yes. Um, although, the, yeah, on the model itself, on the, the 3D part of the model, because there isn't very much distance from the front of the layout to the back, I haven't done that very much because I thought it would be too obvious if you were standing to one side and you've got some four millimeter scale house there and a seven millimeter scale house there. It's going to look wrong. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to uh, Well, the gentleman asked about using photographs to um, base your background on. Certainly you could, um, and I did actually consider using um, a photo, the photographs printed, you know, getting them commercially printed on a large scale and stitching them together. I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with Photoshop or any image editing software, you might be able to create a long back scene. Um, there are some drawbacks though. I mean, if, you, if you're going out and taking your own photographs, then obviously you're doing that at this in 2022. And I'm trying to model 1946. And you know, so you're going to have to do quite a lot of editing out of modern <laughs> transit vans or, or whatever it might be to make it look like 1946. Or modern buildings, obviously. 
uh, and, and, and the other issue is that in that photograph, you may well find there are shapes that just don't help, like uh, perpendicular shapes that, um, because you, you know, I mean, if I had a dry stone wall running away from me down here, I took a photograph, printed the photograph out, I'd have a shape going up the picture, you know, because that's what the camera sees. But if I move to one side when I printed it out, it's going to look like a sort of a pole, you know. It, so it's good. so by painting it by hand, one of the advantages was to be able to control what's there. I mean, another reason for painting it rather than printing it out was because there's a kind of look about anybody's modeling, you know, it, it, like because it's done by a human, you, the, like my kind of level of messiness when I'm making a model will be kind of consistent between a model building I've made and my painting, you know, it, it all has the sort of same feel. Whereas if I did my typical slightly messy kind of modeling work and then a nice crisp photograph, I think it would just clash. Yeah, um, it, you know, if, if it works, it works. Though. You know, I, I, I would never say, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. I mean, it, there are plenty of examples where, if there are examples downstairs where people have used photographs in the background brilliantly. But, uh, I mean, some of the same things I've been talking about still apply. You know, like the problems of perpendicular shapes. And uh, if you're good with Photoshop or, or something like that, there's plenty of scope for adjusting tones, colours, and uh, the amount of aerial perspective in the picture, you know, if you prepare to put the time in. Or, I've no idea what it would actually cost to go and get something printed on a size that would suit a you know, layout like mine, 24 feet long. You know. Oh, yeah, now, um, I, I thought I had a slide on here, which I don't think I have one. But what I do for slates, I print, I first of all, using, I use Adobe Illustrator, but you could use any drawing software. So I print rows of slates, and each row is spaced in the middle of the row above, if that makes sense, you know, that, so that the line between two slates comes halfway along horizontally, but, and I do an A4 sheet full of slates and then uh, before I do anything else, once they're printed, I coat them with knotting, which is what you, you know, as in what you put on knot holes in wood, because it's, well, it's actually diluted shellac and it makes a very good proof against the attacks of oil paints. It makes the paper stiffer and it makes it fairly waterproof as well. I use loads of knotting for all sorts of things. But, um, I think it's because I like the smell. <laughs> but uh, I, when I've coated the slates in knotting, I let it dry, and then I slice them into uh, double rows. Well, I, I slice them first uh, in double rows, and then uh, I slit them horizontally up, the, so the lower row is slit and the upper row is still joined together. And then, I, starting from the bottom of the roof, I slit them on uh, so that only the lower, the lower row of each strip shows. And I'm using the upper row to help me position the next strip. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. I mean, if anyone would like to go into that, please come and see me. I'll try and explain it a bit more effectively. Um, and uh, though I say it myself, I think it works works quite well because the, the, I use whatever it is. I think it's 160 gram card, which is thin enough to look like a scale slate to me. And it's because of the coat of knotting, reasonably durable. You can stand up to a few knocks and then I paint them when they're on the building. Um, obviously, if you're doing slates on a building where you squish the perspective, then the slates have got to be squished as well. 
So it does, you've got to be familiar with your drawing software if you're doing it on a computer. So if I've got a, a pattern of rectangular slates, I squish the whole thing over and um, try it out. If it looks wrong, then I'm going to have to try. I mean, the, again, it's sort of trial and error. But uh, I think some of the ones downstairs will have those squished slates on. Uh, they look odd when you make them, but if they look okay on the building, they are okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, in case you didn't hear, uh, gentleman asked about is that with an inkjet? Yes, just using an ordinary inkjet printer. But the knotting I put on after the printing is done, just to protect it, it stiffens it and it um, uh, gives it waterproof it a bit and protects it against oil paint. So I use a lot of oil paint. And oil paint on ordinary paper, will, it, it will tend to attack the paper over time. I don't know, I don't really know what time scale. I mean, you know, I, I, in 40 years time, I may well not be too worried about it. You know, I'm, I'm 70 now, and in 40 years time, I don't think I'm going to be that worried about a bit of decay in my model. But, having said that, I've got a model which, a 4 millimeter scale model on my grandson's layout, which I did, in, I made originally in about 1980 in that way, using knotting and oil paint over top, and it's fine. So I can guarantee it lasts for at least 40 minutes. Uh, good question. Oh, yes, I mean, uh, using telegraph poles, people, and so forth. What, what I've done, I, mean, for, I haven't got very many people on my layout yet, but I bought a packet of assorted people from one of the suppliers, and they were a little bit, you know, you know not brilliant. So, this is the well below scale anyway, so they kind of solve the problem for me, they're just on the scale. Uh, but if necessary, then I'd use a, you know, something like a four millimeter first. But because people are not to standard height, you know, there's quite a lot of scope for if it looks right, it is right. Um, and uh, there are instances where on one of the low relief models I've got downstairs. I've actually managed to stick in a couple of uh, full fat 3D people because they're not, they are not—they don't have very much depth. They kind of look okay to me. And some details like, for example, chimney pots, because um, they don't have very much depth. I've, I've actually used um, round tube, um, which looks okay. You don't really notice that it's not squished the way it's And it has the advantage that as you move around, it still looks like a chimney pot. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to ask? I mean, if, 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 you want, if you'd like to talk to me about any aspect of it that you think isn't quite the point, or, you know, then right, please do come and see me. I think I'm done. <laughs> so, thank you very much.